soldier boy kisses girl leaves behind a tragic world but he won't mind he's in love and he says love is fine oh yes indeed we know that people will find a way to go no matter what the man said Our love is fine for all we know For all we know our love will grow That's what the man said So won't you listen to what the man said He said Indeed we know that people will find a way to go no matter what the man said. Love is fine for all we know, for all we know our love will grow. That's what the man said. Don't you listen to what the man said. He said. Uh, could you come in now and uh, sit, take your seats, please? Hi, um, my name is uh, Wick Haxton. I'm the chair of the physics department here at uh, UC Berkeley, so it's my pleasure to uh, chair this uh, second session this afternoon. Our first speaker is uh, Ian Agle, who's a professor of mathematics here at UC Berkeley, renowned for his work on the topology of three-dimensional manifolds and on geometric group theory. His important contributions to mathematics include a proof of the Martin tameness conjecture in Kleinian groups, as well as a proof of the virtual, virtually Haken conjecture for which he won the 2016 Breakthrough Prize in mathematics. In 2013, he and Daniel Wise chaired the uh, Veblen Prize in Geometry, and in 2016, he was elected to the National Academy of Sciences. We're really pleased that he's gonna tell us about a famous problem in mathematics, uh, seeking a computer-free proof of the four-color theorem. Eric. Ian? to speak here. It's uh, nice to be able to speak in my hometown. And um, can everyone hear me okay? 
So um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about um, seeking a computer-free proof of the four-color theorem. So um, the the goal of, this, of, of these talks was to talk about stuff that's going to happen in the future, and this is um, not a problem on which I'm an, I'm an expert, but I want to talk about some other people's work. So um, first I want to describe the problem. So as you can see here um, is a, a map of England, and there's these different counties, and um, in the 1800, well, 1852, uh, Francis Guthrie um, noticed that while he was coloring the, this map of England with um, these counties, he could use just four colors. So um, if, you, if you look at this uh, map here, you can see that there's uh, just four colors used. Of course, uh, Wales and Scotland, I guess, are not included. But, um, and um, the properties of, the, uh, of this map is that the, each county is uh, one continuous region, and um, so they're not disconnected. Um, and <clears throat> each uh, county shares a, a certain borderline between it, which is sort of approximated uh, mathematically by uh, an arc or a line. Um, and of course, counties then that are far away from each other, even though they're colored the same color, they um, are distinct. In, um, whereas ones that are neighboring have to be colored with, with different colors. So uh, that's, what, that's what I mean by uh, coloring a map. So it should be coloring with um, colors so that adjacent countries or counties or whatever you're coloring have, a, have different colors, but ones that are far away can have the same color. And so um, Francis Guthrie was not a mathematician. Um, he was a, a lawyer, I believe. But um, so he published this problem in um, the Athenaeum uh, in 1954, uh, sorry, 1854, and um, he had a little uh, blurb on tinting maps, which I've blown up here. So um, he says that in, in tinting maps, so tinting I mean it means coloring. Um, he wants to use as few colors as possible um, so that um, it satisfies the properties I was just saying. And he's found by experience that four colors are necessary and sufficient for this purpose. And he couldn't prove this, but he wanted to know uh, whether this is true. So he advertised this to the world in, um, in this little short little note here. And um, he also uh, com communicated it to, um, uh, <clears throat> to some mathematicians who then um, were, were interested in this problem. And um, in 1879, then, um, Alfred Kempe published proof of the four-color theorem in the American Journal of Mathematics. He wasn't a, um, a <clears throat> professional mathematician. And then an, uh, just a year later, um, Peter Guthrie Tate published uh, another proof, somewhat different, um, in, in the Proceedings of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Um, then in um, 1890, uh, Percy John Haywood published an article that refuted Kempe's proof, so um, about 10 years later, he found that it was actually wrong. And um, you know, the math literature is, is not completely reliable, although I would say it's m much more reliable may maybe than many other sciences. Uh, that's not a, I'm not trying, it's, it's not a dig, I'm just saying that um, we're <clears throat> it's the nature of mathematics, I think. And then in 1891, um, Julius Peterson also refuted Tate's proof. So, um, so after these failed proofs, then the four color problem became sort of notorious and attracted the attention of a lot of uh, mathematicians. Um, David Birkhoff, one of the, the first well-known American mathematicians, Hassler Whitney, and William Tutte. And um, in some sense, attempts to, to solve this problem led to the development of uh, fields of, of mathematics, um, like graph theory and um, topology and combinatorics. Um, so I wanted to say a little bit more about this, uh, this problem. So um, a proof was uh, made in, in 1977 by um, Apple and Hawkins. So that's um, uh, <clears throat> two mathematicians at the Un University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, Wolfgang Hawken is actually the same name, the same mathematician as you heard in the introduction, this uh, virtual Hawken problem that I worked on before. He was a, a topologist studying um, 
three-dimensional spaces and then uh, turned his attention to this um, coloring problem in the 70s. And the, the proof, though, was very unconventional for mathematics up to then. It made use of extensive uh, computer checking. So there was thousands of cases to check, and um, th this, was, this was done by, or, uh, by computer. And there was uh, 100 pages of, um, 400 pages of microfiche supplements they were checked in the summer of 1977 by uh, Wolfgang Hock and, and his, his daughter, Dorothy Bolstein, who was then an undergraduate. So um, the, the reliability of the proof is relying on all this extensive checking of case-by-case -case analysis. I, d I don't want to go into the, um, the mechanics of the proof. Roughly, it's that you um, had a, a map with um, a bunch of different countries, and you showed that there's certain configurations that were unavoid unavoidable in which if you could um, find a coloring of, of, of that map if you could find a coloring of a certain smaller map. And there was a whole bunch of cases to consider. Um, and um, I guess I, I've heard that Hawken compared the, the proof to sort of an engineering thing where there's possibly lots of different proofs and you just had to find enough configurations. There was a lot of different ways, but to combine them in some way that made a proof. And um, there was, it was, could be many different proofs of this flavor and indeed um, some Errors were found in the original proof, and then the revision was made, and the proof published um, in 1989 as a monograph. Um, here you see um, a, uh, a letter um, saying four colors suffice. So that was um, celebrating the, the, the proof of that, of, that, of that theorem in the 70s. Um, <clears throat> so and here's also uh, um, the, the beginning of, of a book that discusses the problem. So if you'd like to learn more about this problem, I, you can recommend them reading this book about the four-color theorem. And there's um, <coughs> Apple and Hawken. So then um, another proof was given in um, the 1990s, 1997. And um, the proof also in, in involved extensive computation. In fact, the, the stuff that was done by hand before um, in this proof had to be done with a computer. Um, so the checking these 400 cases or whatever, there was a lot more cases. Um, and, um, it, but in fact, they, you could take their software they had, they had done to, get, to give this proof and you could download it on your own computer and check it for yourself. So, um, you know, most people, most scientists would be completely happy with that, um, you know, more reliable than, uh, than uh, many scientific observations. Um, I don't know how many sigma that would be considered, but it's, it's anyways, it's a, um, a very reliable uh, fact by this point. And then even more um, reliable, in some sense, in 2005, um, Benjamin Werner and Georges Gontier formalized a proof of the theorem inside the Koch proof assistant. So nowadays, we have a lot of software for checking, um, well, it was initially for checking the um, software itself to see whether it behaved properly. And mathematicians have adapted that to checking proofs to make sure that the proof is logically complete and that every step follows logically from the previous one. And so they went through the, uh, the entire proof of the four-color theorem, and, um, and you can run it on your own system as well and check it. So it's as reliable as the Koch proof assistant, um, which has been used to check many, many theorems or algorithms um, across the sciences. So um, you know, by any um, intents and purposes, this is a, as, as good of a reliable theorem as we might have in mathematics. So um, I wanted to say a little bit more, though, about the, how do you make a, a precise mathematical formulation of the, of the four-color problem. So um, to make it precise, um, well, as I indicated before, you, could, you should assume that countries or counties are connected. Um, so connectivity is actually a little subtle concept you know, in, embodied in the field of topology. We've heard about topology in, the other, in some math and physics talks today. but. Um, Topology is, is the discussion of connectivity or um, looking at geometric spaces, but you allow them to deform but without cutting or gluing. Um, and this, this robustness of deformation. So if I have a, of a map, I can deform it a little bit. And uh, as long as I don't um, change the connectivity of the countries or, or counties or whatever, and um, I can you know, make the line straight or something, you're still gonna require the same number of colors. So the number of colorings of a map, for example, is a topological invariant of that map. It's invariant under deformation. You might have to use a little more paint in one than another, but just the number of colors is invariant. 
So, um, but also to make this precise, I said that you had to um, have the, the boundaries between the countries be, um, be curves. And um, this is a mathematical model for what a, what a map looks like. Um, and also to make that precise, you need the Jordan curve theorem, which says that a, a non-self-intersecting curve in the plane, a closed circle, um, actually bounds a, a, a connected region, a, which is topologically a disk. So there's a, um, some serious mathematics that goes into that. This is something that was that Georges Gontier and his collaborators did um, to, to formalize the proof. And anyways, the mathematicians then knew for a long time how to make this problem into a, a well-defined mathematical problem. So it required a little bit of topology, some classic topology from the um, 19th century. Then Tate, this, uh, <clears throat> William Guthrie Tate, um, gave a useful reformulation of the four color problem. So, um, well, <clears throat> one observation is you can look at uh, maps where um, the, the borders between countries, you have most three countries meeting at a given, um, at a given uh, border. So if this were a map here, then um, you, at each vertex, which is the interface between three or more countries, there's the most three countries there. So if you had four, like uh, four corners in the United States, um, you can perturb that and you can let um, two of the, the diagonal countries be adjacent. And if you can color that map, then you can color the one in which um, there's the four corners there because there's um, you know, fewer, fewer constraints. There's um, <clears throat> fewer borders between the countries. And so it's even easier to color with four colors. So a, a well-known uh, simplification of the problem is to assume you have a graph in which um, the, all the vertices are degree three, like in this picture here, which is the dodecahedral -Do -Do graph. And um, <clears throat> we can also talk about then abstract graphs. And as I indicated, you know, the, the, the theory of graph theory, which is you know, very important in, in modern mathematics and other applications, is um, thinking about graphs, which to a mathematician are a collection of vertices, so we have a collection of points, and then we have edges connecting them. And here I've drawn edges that overlap, um, but those should be thought of as distinct, so to abstract connections between um, vertices. So then we can ask whether a graph can be drawn in the plane so that every pair of edges is non-crossing. Um, and this dodecahedral graph visually is apparently uh, planar. This graph here called the Peterson graph uh, which is you take this graph and you identify antipodal points um, in some sense, is, is non-planar. Um, and that can be proved, again, using topology. There's the, the Kuratowski um, criterion that, sh that shows that this is, um, is not planar. If you contract these five edges around here, you get uh, a complete graph on five vertices, which is, cannot be embedded in the plane. If you try to make uh, a map in which five different kingdoms are simultaneously connected to each other by borders. It's impossible on the surface of the Earth unless they're just connected. Or, um, <clears throat> so um, anyway, so that's the, um, <clears throat> a more precise description of this four color problem. So uh, as I was just indicating, a graph's planar if it can be drawn in the plane. Um, we see some planar graphs here. This is a, this is a non-planar graph. K33 graph, and, um, and looking at some of these graphs, it might not be so obvious whether they can be embedded in the plane or not. This is what's called a Mobius ladder and is also non-planar. So um, if we have a, a trivalent graph, so a graph in which all the vertices have degree three, then um, we'll let Tate of G, so G, I'm calling G a trivalent graph, so I'm gonna think of that as some collection of vertices and edges, just finite, and um, we'll let Tate of G to denote the number of Tate colorings. So um, what is that? It's a coloring of the edges by three colors so that each vertex meets all, these, all three colors. So here's some examples of Tate coloring. So we have the complete graph on four vertices. Every vertex is connected by an edge to every, every other vertex in this graph. And we can color the edges red, blue, and green so that um, at each vertex we see all three colors. That's called a Tate coloring. Here's a Tate coloring of the dodecahedral graph, which has um, <clears throat> 60 different colorings. In fact, they're, they're all invariant, it turns out, by um, automorphism, symmetries, and um, by, by switching the three colors. Here's the, 
the Peterson graph again, now draw in, drawn in three dimensions, this has no Tate colorings. And that can be um, just checked by hand. It's just a, there's finitely many ways you can color the edges and you can run through those permutations or you can try to be a little clever and, and check that it ha doesn't have a three coloring. <clears throat> so Tate showed that um, Tate colorings are equivalent to, a planar graph is equivalent to four coloring the region. So you start with one region called gray and each time you cross an edge, if there's a Tate coloring, you change it in, according to this pattern here. So um, if, or if two regions are, are col four colored, then um, the edge between them will be cover colored in this way. So if you're green and, and red adjacent, then you'll, the edge will be colored blue. Uh, and so you get a, a, an equivalence between these colorings. This actually requires, a, again, a little bit of topology that uh, this, the, the plane is simply connected that makes this work. But, um, all right, so <clears throat> in 2015, Peter Cronheimer, um, a professor at Harvard, and Thomas Mravka, they um, had two preprints they posted on the archive that um, described a program to try to reprove the four color theorem. They described an invariant now of, um, called J sharp of G, which I'm not going to be able to describe, which is now G is a spatial trivalent graph. So um, like this um, Peterson graph here, you're looking at a graph embedded into space. So again, it's a topological object, and it's invariant that's invariant under de, up to deformation. So um, this invariant is a vector space of, over the field with two elements, 0 and 1, like uh, Vincent described. But it's just characterized by a number. So it's a number j sharp. Uh, the dimension is the um, number n, which <coughs> characterizes it. Um, and so the definition made use of what's called instant time fluoromology. Uh, some ideas of Simon Donaldson, the 2015 Breakthrough Prize winner in mathematics, and um, his work made use of Yang's Mills theory, so a theory in mathematical physics. So um, I've taken a few slides from their talk at the ICM. If you want to learn more about this, I would suggest looking at their, um, their talks from the, 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 IC, the International Congress of Mathematicians. So these, they're trivalent graphs. Here's a graph with a bridge, and um, these graphs here are, um, are bridgeless. So um, now I can state their theorem. They show that if you have a, a bridgeless graph, then the, this number, this dimension of the space is positive. And then they conjecture that if you have a planar graph, so that, um, I forgot to say here that they're calling, uh, I call it a web, so a, a web is a, is a spatial graph, then they, they conjecture that the number of take colorings is the same as the dimension of this invariant that they show is non-zero. And then um, in 2017, they show that dimension is greater than or equal to the number of take colorings. So it's um, at least giving some evidence for this conjecture. But it's in the wrong direction if you want to prove the four color theorem. You'd like to prove the opposite inequality. Um, and so, uh, yeah, maybe I'll just um, skip this, um, these slides here. Let's see. So I'll, I'll say briefly about uh, what they were trying to do. So they thought of colorings instead as um, assigning three axes, coordinate axes, which are perpendicular to each other in R3. Um, and you can think of a Tate coloring that way. It's just a, a trivial um, observation. But they more generally assigned um, a lines, configurations of lines in, in, um, in R3 in which were perpendicular to each other at, uh, at, each, ver at each vertex. And they counted these in a certain sense, uh, making use of this technology that came from gauge theory and um, knot theory. So um, they showed the non-triviality of this. I think, I guess I'm out of time, so, or, oh, oh I got to, oh, okay, a couple minutes, okay. Um, so they, the, the, the way they show this is a little surprising. So they, um, they instead counted, instead of counting lines, they, they change it to an invariant counting oriented lines, so lines with a direction on them. And, um, and, and counting in a very careful way uh, using this um, technology from gauge theory. And then um, they show that if this invariant that they call I sharp of G is non-trivial, then, um, then J sharp of G would be, would be positive, uh, have positive dimension. And then um, they had previously shown that this I sharp of G is positive when G is a knot or link, so a collection of closed loops um, in, in space. Um, and then they show that that proof extended to the graph case under this bridgeless condition. So um, 
that was, um, so it was a very surprising relation then of this problem, uh, the, or the, potentially the four color problem, to some technology they had developed to understand knot theory. So closed loops embedded in three dimensions. So um, a very deep uh, involved um, arguments that they had. So um, <clears throat> their conjecture that these two quantities for a planar graph are equivalent would imply that any bridgeless planar graph has a Tate coloring. I forgot, forgot to say that it's also known that if you have a planar graph with a bridge, then the number of Tate colorings is just zero. And then that would imply that it, the regions of the planar graph can be four colored. So um, that would give an, another proof of this, um, of this four color problem if this conjecture holds true. So th th this is a motivating project. I'm sure they're hard at work on it. Um, and I think other people are, are thinking about this. I've been running a seminar on it, trying to understand what they've done. So um, the, the main difficulty then um, is that they don't really have a, a method of computing their invariant, J sharp of G. Um, and if they could develop the techniques to, to compute that invariant, it would probably allow them to prove the theorem or at least maybe find a counterexample, um, and, or their, their conjecture, I should say. And, if they, but if they could compute this, it would actually um, be a breakthrough in, um, in, in three and four, four dimensional topology, which, which is what they study. So it's, um, it would allow you to c compute other interesting invariants and ho hopefully prove uh, other theorems. And I think they came across this sort of accidentally in trying to investigate invariants for knots and some of the properties that they hold. And it would also be interesting because mathematicians, they really want to understand why theorems are true, not just that they are true. The, I mean, it's, it's, also, it's always nice to know some, whether something's true or false, but we're really seeking, mathematics is seeking understanding. And having a computer-aided proof that requires you know, huge case-by-case -case analysis doesn't necessarily give you a lot of understanding. Maybe it will eventually to, to AI or machines or something, but to, to people in some sense, or mathematicians in particular, we're not very satisfied with that sort of proof, even though it's, it's a, it was a great accomplishment. And, um, and there's, since then, there's been many mathematical proofs that have been done using a computer. And then it would be also interesting, I think, to have very deep modern mathematics of gauge theory and um, three and four dimensional topology to have this implication for um, an old problem in two dimensions of coloring maps. So I think it would be quite exciting. If, and, and I think it's a promising. I, I'm not going to give any you know, like prediction, you know, maybe 10 years, but who knows? It could take them much longer, but hopefully this conjecture will be resolved one way or another in the near future. So, thanks. Just, just to put in a clarification, that very first map you had on there, there were yeah. the white provinces you actually couldn't have colored with the four colors because they were abutting four other colors. But I assume then if you wanted to include those, you just have to change the colors of the other things? Well, let's see. It looks like, so, yeah, so, so like Scotland, I think you there. have an, uh, another color. But yeah, it looks it, like. It looks like uh, there's four things abutting. No, I think it. you can make well, maybe Wales red. That little but yeah, red no, thing. That's, it's not clear that, um, yeah, you can always extend the coloring. So you might have to modify it. Yeah. Um, there's certain situations where there's very simple, I realize there's very simple proofs of the four color theorem. If you assume that every country has at least six neighbors, which is not a usual thing, but um, then actually you can find a very simple proof that um, doesn't need any computer checking. But that's not a, in general the problem is that you'll have countries that are, have very few neighbors and that makes it more constrained and harder to color in some sense. But yeah, that's, um, that's a good observation. Uh, I have a question. In your opinion, what's the practical significance of number four? Uh, why there are four colors? F suppose we need five colors or six. What would change in the world if it would be yeah. not four? <laughs> yeah, what would it change in the world? I don't know. Um, let's see. Yeah, there's, there's a very simple proof that uses, um, that you can use six colors. And then there's a simpler proof that was found by Kempe that you can use five colors. It wouldn't really have any significance to map coloring, uh, you know, it's, it's not hard to, to extend your palette to more than four colors. Um, it's, it's more just in mathematicians are intrigued by old unresolved problems, and this is a problem that was just turned out to be hard and um, it, you know, it incited a lot of interesting mathematics and work. Um, and you, you, know, you, may, you never know, um, you know where, what techniques might be useful for something um, in, in the future. 
So uh, I don't have a good answer, though, as to, that, you know, it's not going to cure cancer or anything, so, <laughs> as far as I know. Last one right here. Yeah. Is there a three-dimensional version of the four-color problem? Oh, yeah, great. Yeah, so that, um, there, there are various formulations. Um, again, the, the difficulty in three dimensions is, is that you can make countries um, you adjacent. So like if you had N countries, which are all shared a common border, then, um, then you, you would need N colors. And you, in three dimensions, you can do that. So you have, to, you have to constrain the problem in some way. And there are formulations like certain polytopes or things. So you, you require the faces to be, to be flat or various things. And you can find lists of these problems, uh, like a math overflow. There's a collection of problems like this. That there's there's way, other ways you can generalize it. There's a so-called Hadwiger's conjecture. That's a, another kind of generalization that's sort of like a high dimensional, but it's purely graph theoretic. Uh, <clears throat> that's sort of extending Kuratowski's criterion and then asking. Um, so. Um, but yeah, the, the, there's, um, there's, there's a variety of ways you, extend, you can extend it, but um, it, there's not so much that's proved. There, I think, in general, there's, there's bounds on various problems, but not, not precise formulas for the number of columns. But yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Our next speaker, uh, Frank Bennett, is Senior Vice President of Research and Leader for the Neurology pro uh, Programs at Ionis uh, Pharmaceuticals, where he has contributed to numerous uh, discoveries over the past 30 years that have advanced our ability to treat genetic disorders and infections. He has published more than 200 papers in the field and holds more than 175 U.S. patents. He shared this year's Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences with Adrian Crater for the development of uh, Nusin Ersen, which has produced spectacular results in treating uh, the motor neuron disease, spinal uh, muscular atrophy. In the talk, talk Dr. Craner uh, delivered this morning, he described how the development of this drug utilized DNA splicing. Dr. Bennett will tell us about new possibilities for gene therapies that will arise in the coming uh, decade. Uh, the title of his talk is uh, Genetic Medicines, Present and Future. Uh, let's welcome uh, Frank Bennett. So I'd, uh, sorry, I'd like to echo my uh, thanks for uh, the Breakthrough Prize, Prize Committee for recognizing the work that we've done to, to develop the therapy that Adrian talked about earlier today. And also I'd like to thank you for, for being with us today. Um, I'm going to do an experiment, and so I've never given this talk before, so if I do, uh, don't do well, it's a failed experiment. I'm sure everybody in the audience has had failed experiments uh, in their career. So what I wanted to do is, is sort of give you an idea of what uh, I, I see the future of medicine being. And uh, I'm actually going to start off uh, describing what I see that future is. Then I'll, what I'll do is walk through, I, I think we're closer to this future than many of you may anticipate. And, and so really, I, I see with the advancements that we have in genomic medicine, uh, by being able to do DNA sequencing uh, for very low cost, that uh, you'll see in the future, all newborns will get uh, uh, genetic testing. And for those of us who have passed that period of time, uh, we'll have adult genetic testing as well. And that will uh, identify predicted disease risk uh, associated with our uh, slight differences. And just to put this in context, there are uh, approximately 3 billion base pairs in our DNA. There's hundreds of thousands of variations in this room. Uh, so my, my DNA is slightly different uh, than, than yours. And it's these variations that contribute to our genetic traits and also uh, unfortunately, uh, make us at risk for, for developing uh, uh, diseases. And so for those diseases where there is a genetic basis, I see that gen uh, genome sequencing as well as epigenome sequencing as uh, being used to help predict uh, disease risk. I think what uh, I originally was thinking this could be done in 10 years, but I think this next box down here 
uh, is probably going to delay this, uh, and it's probably more likely uh, 20 years, is that uh, there are a lot of bioethics uh, uh, issues that we have to resolve before we can fully implement uh, this strategy. And, and uh, uh, part of that is also education uh, of the public, uh, uh, that uh, how to utilize this information for, for uh, uh, their, their own benefit. And ultimately, I see that uh, this genetic information is going to uh, allow us to make lifestyle changes early in life uh, where they'll have the biggest impact. For those uh, people who are at risk of developing a disease so such that you know, if you find a, a risk gene for cancer, you'll do frequent monitoring for cancer. Uh, if you don't have that risk gene, you can decrease the amount of monitoring that you're doing and, and that's gonna uh, uh, save healthcare costs. And then finally, for uh, some diseases, you may want to start treating prophylactically, and I'll give you an example of that to, in, in my talk. And uh, that can include small molecule drugs, uh, protein-based drugs, as well as uh, what I'll focus on is some of the genetic medicines. And part of the reason I wanted to focus there is that it's my belief that uh, the genetic medicines are really where the future is going to be. Uh, uh, developing small molecule drugs is very effective, but it's also quite expensive. And the expense comes not so much from the work that it takes to find that small molecule drug, but the failures. And with genetic medicines, I see a way that we, we can utilize the information that's encoded in our genome to decrease the number of failures that we have going forward. So ultimately, I think it's going to be more cost effective uh, uh, for us as a society to sort of embrace these genetic medicines. Today, they're expensive, but I, I do see that uh, uh, long term, they're going to be one of the solutions that we utilize. Um, sorry. So how do we get there? And, and so before I, uh, we, we can get there, I wanted to sort of give you where we've been. And uh, this is a publication that was describing the gene that caused Huntington's disease. And Huntington's disease is an uh, inherited neurological disease. And for those of you who are old enough to remember Woody Guthrie, it's what uh, Woody Guthrie died from. And, and so uh, it was known that it was an inherited disease, but it wasn't uh, really identified what causes the disease until this landmark publication in 1993. And the reason I highlighted it is that if you look at the author list, this is like some of the uh, astronomy, uh, astrophysics papers where there's hundreds of people listed on the paper. But in this case, there were 58 scientists that were listed that, that contributed to this work. And most of those scientists spent 10 years to track down this, this uh, uh, gene. This does not include all the lab technicians and, and other people that helped uh, do the work. So there are you know, literally hundreds of people that were involved in, in identifying that gene. Uh, that work really spawned the modern genomic error. And uh, eight years later, we had the complete sequence of the human genome. And again, that was a very expensive effort that we, we undertook to, to get the complete sequence of the human genome. It uh, took roughly 15 years and, and $3 billion in, in cost to get that. Um, but today, that's had dramatic impacts. And so if you look at uh, the cost today to sequence anybody in this room, it's roughly gone from $100 million uh, uh, you know, 18 years ago to under $1,000. So, and I see that cost uh, continuing to, to drive down as we develop new technologies for uh, sequencing uh, in, in the future. So it's gonna make it very affordable and, and it, it will be an important part of how we manage our health in the future. Um, also, what's happened is that because we have, it's very inexpensive now to uh, sequence the genome, we have identified the genetic causes for a large number of diseases, and uh, I think the number is well over 6,000 genes that have been identified today that either are directly contributing to a disease uh, th through a genetic mutation or genetic change, or indirectly contributing uh, to a disease. So the a uh, number of genes that, that were, are potentially serving as drug targets, and I, I should mention, I, I am a, a, a drug hunter. I've been working in the industry for 35 years now. Uh, the number of genes that, that's increasing is, is increasing dramatically, and so I think you know, within 20 years, we'll know what most of the genes in our body are doing and how they're contributing to health and disease. So the, the problem is, how do we translate these exciting scientific findings into therapies that will help patients? And as I said earlier, I think uh, genetic medicines will play a key role in our future. And I'll show you one example in the next slide. So just to remind you, uh, the, the central dogma of life is that DNA is where we uh, store the information that, that codes for our, 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 ourselves. It, that's transcribed into an intermediate molecule called RNA. And 
uh, really a pleasure being at Berkeley today because uh, it's been a really hotbed of RNA science over the last 50 years or so. Uh, and, and one of our early uh, scientific advisor boards was a, a Berkeley professor. Um, and, but the RNA then gets translated to protein. And most drugs today, uh, uh, that I should step back, that uh, most diseases are recognized as, as being uh, diseases either through abnormal proteins, so you have a mutation in a gene that causes the protein to function abnormally, or you're missing that protein uh, due to a deletion or a mutation that causes it to not be translated. Or um, that maybe there's something going on in the cell that, that uh, harms that protein, and so you have a lot of uh, uh, other modifications that can occur. And so as a result, most of the drugs that we have today uh, are targeting proteins. So there's both small molecule drugs, things like Lipitor or aspirin or uh, uh, ibuprofen, or biologics. And, and antibodies are a great example of some of the biologics that are uh, being uh, utilized today. Um, the um, uh, and these have been very effective uh, going for, uh, in the past. What I'd like to do is describe some alternative approaches. And so we use a technology called antisense oligonucleotides. And so what we do is that we use the information that's coded within the DNA, uh, the RNA structure using the Watson-Crick base pairing recognition rules. So we have a, 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 an ability to tune our, our drugs to bind only to one RNA in the cell. Uh, no other RNA using Watson Crick base pairing rules. And when we do that, the uh, 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 oligonucleotide can evoke a number of different changes in the cell, uh, including a number of different enzymes that we utilize to degrade the RNA. RNA-SH is one of the enzymes that we use quite a bit. Uh, there's another enzyme called uh, ALGO2 or RISC. Uh, you heard earlier about it. It's an siRNA trigger mechanism. But there are a variety of enzymes that we can use to cause that RNA to go away. So if you remove the RNA, you no longer make the protein. And so it's a very simplistic uh, approach for, for treating diseases is that you prevent the protein from ever being produced. Alternatively, and as you heard from Adrian's uh, talk earlier today, we can use oligonucleotides to... Um, uh, perturb intermediate metabolism of the RNA, such as modulating splicing and, and helping the cell decide which intron or which, I'm sorry, which exon to, to use. And there are a number of other ways that we can use oligonucleotides to modulate the, the biology that's going on. So um, this isn't Star Wars. Um, there are six uh, drugs that have been currently approved by the FDA for treating a variety of different diseases, including viral infections. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, high cholesterol, and uh, a number of neurological diseases, which has been an area that uh, we're, we're finding this to be very amenable to this technology. And there are over 50 drugs that are currently in clinical trials that are being tested to, to ultimately hope, you know, not all of them are gonna work, but hopefully a large percentage will work and uh, be able to treat uh, even a broader spectrum of diseases. So I'd just like to focus on uh, Nusenirsen. Uh, which is a drug to treat uh, spinal muscular atrophy. And just very quickly uh, to highlight, since the approval of Nusenirsen, uh, the, the, uh, adopt, it's the uh, CDC has adopted putting uh, SMA on the newborn screening panel. So today in the United States, it's recommended to all the states in the US that they, they test infants as they're born to see if they're at risk for developing this uh, neuromuscular disease. And, Part of the reason is because what we have found is that if you look at um, uh, the most severe form of this disease, is called type one uh, SMA, and unfortunately it accounts for about half of the babies born will, will develop this disease. And uh, they develop symptoms within the first six months of life, and unfortunately they have a very short life expectancy. So they essentially become paralyzed, and the only way you can keep them alive is through ventilation, and then using artificial feeding uh, to keep them alive. Um, and, and so their life expectancy was less than two years. And what we found is that when we treated these infants who were genetically diagnosed, but before they developed symptoms, that we can uh, markedly impact the disease. We haven't cured it, but these infants now are doing things that uh, was never heard of. So they're developing normally. Uh, we have children now that uh, are walking uh, uh, based upon uh, treatment with this drug. And it was treatment that was started before they had any symptoms and, and really, I think it highlights the point that uh, you know, pre-symptomatic treatment is the best way to treat uh, diseases or prevent diseases from occurring. Uh, so it's made a major impact on that disease. So in, in the future, uh, you know, I, I do believe that uh, our technology, the antisense technology, will continue to evolve. 
Uh, we already have ways to, uh, uh, um, I should highlight that, sorry. Uh, the, the current technology is an injectable drug, so either subcutaneous for some of the uh, deliveries or as uh, 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 tissues, or as Adrian highlighted, intrathecal for the CNS diseases. Uh, but we, I can see a path that we're going to ultimately get orally delivered antisense drugs. And uh, we are, we're doing a number of studies today uh, where we're doing clinical trials using this technology where we're delivering it orally. So I, I think we're not uh, too far away from having that being a reality. And the other advantage that we'll see is being able to specifically only target certain tissues in your body. So uh, most drugs will distribute throughout your body and produce effects in, in the tissues that you want it to produce effects. But a lot of times the side effects are, are, are due to the drug uh, binding uh, its receptor or, or its protein in uh, tissues that you don't want it to. And, and so by being able to tailor uh, where a drug goes and what tissues it works in is going to give us safer and more effective drugs uh, in, in the future. Um, other uh, genetic therapies that I see coming on the horizon, one is a, 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 a gene therapy or gene replacement therapy. And today, that's being practiced two ways. Uh, one is uh, using viral vectors that are delivering the genetic material. So if you're missing a protein, uh, you have a mutation that causes a protein to, to be missing, you can replace that protein using gene therapy. Uh, the other approach is using uh, uh, lipid nanoparticles that you heard Dr. Langer uh, present earlier uh, today is another approach to deliver these large nucleic acids. Um, we're still at the beginning uh, of this technology. It's been around a long time, and it's taken a, uh, it's a lot more complex than the antisense approach. But I, I clearly see that it's, it's beginning to deliver on, it, on its promise. And I see over time it's going to evolve, so it's a much more tunable uh, 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 system to, to get uh, expression where you want it to be and also to be able to control expression. So if you run into any safety issues, you can shut it back off. Uh, uh, and the, the last uh, approach that I see is, is gene editing, and, and Dr. Doudna presented uh, again earlier today about her work on uh, CRISPR-Cas9, and that's uh, really a, a breakthrough uh, technology from a research lab to be able to uh, very efficiently edit genomes in, in uh, our exper experimental organisms. And you see that I could see that very uh, in the not too distant future, starting to, to impact uh, other diseases where we, we'll be able to use it as a therapeutic approach. In fact, um, one of the things I really do believe is going to uh, be identified is that there may be endogenous pathways that we can exploit to do gene editing without having to add this uh, exogenous bacterial protein. And, and so I, I think that's really futuristic, but I, I see a, that, uh, again, that's going to be something that we'll be able to do in, in, in the future. So just to uh, finalize, uh, just uh, that we, we view that the completion of the human genome sequence has dramatically advanced our uh, um, ability to, to identify diseases. And there are a variety of genetic uh, uh, approaches that we can use for uh, developing therapies based upon this genomic uh, uh, revolution that we're going through within biology. And uh, again, what I predict uh, is that we'll have, everybody will have their sequence, and, and I, I truly believe that knowledge is, is good for everybody. Uh, we still have to do a lot of information to be able to interpret that sequence, but uh, I, I do see that uh, uh, your ability to know what your future lies uh, based upon your genotype uh, is, is going to be very important for ma maintaining your health. And, and so finally, uh, just to acknowledge the patients and their families who participate in their clinical trials. They, uh, uh, without the patients, the bravery of, of, of the patients, we wouldn't have any drugs today. And so I just really want to acknowledge them. And then finally, my collaborators who have uh, worked with me on the various projects, including uh, my, my collaborator for this uh, prize, Dr. Adrian Craner. Uh, thank you very much. This is very exciting, but I wonder if you would elaborate a little on the, uh, that box you mentioned of, in your earlier slide on uh, the ethics and genetic counseling issues. I was just struck, I'm struck by the Ludditeism, so to speak, genetic, well, there's genetic Luddites, you might say, uh, similar to the anti-vaccination campaigns right. we see so prominently, certainly in 
in my own county here in California. Um, and getting this accepted, this approach, um, would seem to me to involve some major uh, convincing of many people. Uh, can, could you elaborate on uh, how you would visualize uh, what, getting this accepted, this general approach? Yeah, so I'm probably not the best person uh, to do that because that's not something that I do on a routine basis. But number one, I think education has got to, we got to do a much better job uh, educating people what this information means and how to interpret it. And part of the problem in medicine is there are a lot of unknowns today. And so, uh, you know, the regulators have this paternalistic uh, attitude that if we don't know what it means, we shouldn't tell people uh, about it. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I do view it as being one of the critical issues that we have to resolve. And I, number one is education. I think we need to do a much better job of educating uh, our, our colleagues and, and our neighbors and uh, uh, the rest of the people in this country uh, what science is and what, how to use the information that science has provided. It's not you know, the meaning of life, but it, it gives us an ability to manage our own health. Uh, Is the information and the techniques that you are using now being applied uh, to the other end of the lifespan, that is anti-aging concerns and increasing longevity, Sure. perhaps by focusing on part like the loss of muscle mm -hmm. in the elderly and... Yeah, so, so clearly within the industry, that's um, a, a, a focus of part of the industry. There's what I'll call a, a part of the industry that's exploiting uh, people for, for that, where um, I don't want to quite call them snake oil salesmen, but I think some of them were very close to being snake oil salesmen. But within the legitimate uh, pharmaceutical industry, there's a recognition that that's part of our health, and uh, there's a lot of research going on into you know, looking at muscle as an example, and how do we maintain muscle strength, or how do we maintain uh, our cognitive abilities as we age, and, and so, uh, we're not there yet, but I, I do see that we'll, you know, that is an area of the future for, for the uh, in industry and, and for us. Yeah, I had a question. Would this gene therapy help someone grow who's stunt, whose growth is stunted through puberty? So, um, potentially. I mean, again, with the, the genetic identification, there are genes that cause, say, dwarfism or, or a short stature. And um, I'm not sure we'll be able to fix that, and I'm not sure we should. Um, but, uh, you know, because I, I do feel that the diversity is what makes us a, a society. Uh, but I, I do think that for people who have uh, sort of a medical condition that can develop because of the dwarfism, uh, that there may be ways that we could prophylactically prevent it from occurring or at least minimize the impact of, of the disease. Yeah. Um, I'm a terrific talk. I was intrigued by the idea of a... Um, a, a human encoded CRISPR like molecule, and, and was wondering whether you could um, hypothesize about where one might find something in it, perhaps in the immune system or, or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, so I think what we've learned from biology over the years is that the, uh, what one organism develops as a system, uh, it's actually replicated uh, throughout life. And there may be, it may be totally vestigial, uh, but you know, we've found evidence that there's CRISPR-like sequences in the human genome. Um, and so why those sequences are there, as I said, they could be vestigial and no longer of impact, but it kind of makes you wonder if uh, there are pathways that we just don't understand today that may, uh, th this you may be able to exploit therapeutically. And, and that's very conjectural at, at this point, but it's, it is intriguing that these sequences exist. Uh. Our third speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Jocelyn uh, Bell Burnell, who's a radio astronomer and astrophysicist who served as uh, president of the Royal Astro Astronomical Society, only the second woman uh, to do so, and is the first woman uh, pres president of both the Institute of Physics and the Royal Society of Edinburgh. She is currently uh, chancellor of the University of Dundee 
and a visiting professor at uh, Oxford University. While still a PhD student, she discovered the first radio pulsar, a rapidly spinning neutron star that arises as, as an incredibly compact remnant of a supernova explosion. Pulsars serve as precise astronomical clocks and have been exploited as laboratories for testing general relativity, yielding the first evidence for the existence of gravitational waves. Her title this afternoon is Radio Burst, What's Going On Among the Stars? Please uh, welcome Dr. Bell. Thank you very much and congratulations on your staying power. <laughs> so what I want to talk about this evening is something that has arisen out of the field of pulsar research, which I have been following for most of my adult life. It's a brand new topic called fast radio bursts, and it seems to me to be one of the most exciting developments in astronomy, astrophysics at the moment. Uh, a little bit of recapping. I'm going to be talking almost exclusively about a topic within radio astronomy. So a quick reminder here about the electromagnetic spectrum. Tiny little bit in the middle that our eyes can see. Out the violet side of the rainbow, ultraviolet, X-rays, gamma rays. Out the red side, infrared, millimeter radio. We now know that stars and galaxies radiate right across that whole lot. And not each one of them over all of it, but between them. You can do astronomy at any of those wavelengths. So I'm going to be focusing particularly on radio astronomy, uh, which developed post-World War II when radar um, boffins, as they were inevitably called, returned home and used the receiving techniques from radar, not the transmitting, just the receiving, to look at the sky and found many, many fascinating things. So you're probably well aware of radio telescopes. Uh, one of the early ones is at Jodrell Bank in the United Kingdom. Uh, the US's biggest one is in Puerto Rico, the Arecibo radio telescope, at least the biggest single dish. There's another very large one in New Mexico called the VLA, or the Very Large Array. Uh, a little bit of physics for those who are not physicists. I need to be able to explain um, what we can do by studying dispersion. Dispersion is what you get, for example, when light shines through a raindrop or when light shines through a glass prism. You get white light split out into its constituent colors. The different colors have different wavelengths or different frequencies and travel in slightly different paths through the raindrop or the prism. There is a radio equivalent of this. And it first came to light, uh, people doing uh, audio studies, electromagnetic studies of the near-Earth environment. And they picked up something that they named a whistler. We're about to hear an audio recording um, this may give you advance warning. There's a lot of static on this recording. You're listening for a signal that starts at a high frequency and drops in note. <whistles> Only it probably won't be that clear. Now, what has happened is on the other side of the Earth, there's been a lightning flash. The lightning flash generates a very sharp radio pulse <coughs> that contains all the possible radio frequencies. And this radio signal sets off towards us in the Northern Hemisphere. It's guided round by the magnetic field lines and travels through space that's fairly empty, but not completely empty. There are some free electrons in that space. And free electrons affect radio waves the way glass and raindrops affect light rays. It separates out the constituent frequencies. So what we hear arriving after that journey is not the 
but the component frequencies arriving one after the other, starting with the highest frequencies and descending. So you get this descending whistle. Radio astronomers make this use of this regularly. The one other bit of information I need to give you is how quickly this descends depends on how many free electrons the radio wave has come past. So if it's made a short journey, the track would be a lot steeper. If it had made a longer journey, it would have been a lot more spread out. So with that bit of information, question for you. Can anybody tell me where this one has come from or where this one has come from? Have they come a long way? No, they're local. These are locally generated interference signals. Uh, your mobile phone, your digital camera, sometimes microwave ovens can generate interference signals, and they'd show up on these as vertical lines. So that's dispersion, and I now turn briefly to pulsars. A cartoon of a pulsar, a tiny star spinning quite rapidly, a pair of radio beams probably coming out from the magnetic poles, and sweeping round the sky like a lighthouse beam. If the beam shines in our face, we get a pulse, like now. The other beam misses us, now. Misses, now. And they come round very, very regularly, because this is a surprisingly massive star with a large moment of inertia. Those radio pulses from a pulsar are travelling through space, to reach us on the Earth. And one of the issues we have when we're studying pulsars is we see a flash. Is it a pulsar or is it locally generated interference from your digital camera or your mobile phone? So routinely, the radio astronomers make this kind of plot where the different frequencies are plotted against time and you get this same descending whistle type of note. That means it's come a long way. If this were vertical, it would say that spike was a blast of local interference. And furthermore, pulsar astronomers can, see, can tell from how fast this is descending how far away the pulsar is. And that's absolutely routine. They always do these plots because it's a superb way of distinguishing between a pulse that's local interference and a pulse that is a pulsar. So, when a radio astronomer saw this kind of plot, here's the nice pulse, here's the descending signal, they said, great, pulsar. And then they stopped and they looked at how slowly this was descending. And it's going extremely slowly so there's an awful lot of electrons between us and that source. So how far away is it? All the pulsars we've seen so far are in our galaxy. So we've got a good measure of how many electrons there are in any direction in our galaxy. And in the direction of this thing, let's say it's straight down the aisle, in the direction of this thing, there aren't enough electrons in our galaxy to explain that slow descent. You need a lot more electrons. So it has to be beyond the galaxy. The snag is when you get to the edge of the galaxy, the electron density drops like a stone because you've reached the edge of the galaxy. You're in intergalactic space where there are some electrons, but they're not nearly so common. And so to explain the remaining number of electrons to get that slowly descending whistle, you have to go miles and miles and miles. Okay, this thing, whatever it is, is maybe in another galaxy, and that other galaxy, that host galaxy, will give you some electrons, but it's still in a very distant galaxy. And while we just had one of these, 
It was a big question mark. We checked with other astronomers whether there was any optical emission, X-ray emission, what have you, in that direction. No, nothing doing. So, ultimately, Duncan Lorimer of Virginia, West Virginia, um, decided to publish this. It was still the only one known, but he couldn't find anything wrong with the logic, the detection, the equipment, so he published. And for a long time, it remained the only one. And then we started finding more. It was always the pulsar astronomers who found them, because it's, all, it's always these pulsar astronomers who are looking for quite short pulses and are checking the dispersion. Most of the pulses we have discovered, we've discovered by chance. We now have about 70 discrete sources all around the sky. With one exception, they never repeat. Um, the one exception turns out to be useful because it does repeat and you can go back and get some more pulses from it and do some more studies. And it turns out to be in a galaxy quite a long way off. And that's consistent with these other ones, these single ones, which also are at considerable distance, way, way beyond the galaxy, at what we call redshifts of 0.5 or 1. At last, we've done a survey, just one survey, only published about a week ago. And they found a number more. And they're now able to say that, by and large, the brighter ones are nearer. No great surprise there. That makes sense, but good to know. And we're still not much closer knowing what they are. The whistle very, very accurately follows the frequency dependence we expect. Frequency to the minus 2.000. Pretty good. And some of them have this little scattering tail due to blobby stuff in the interstellar medium. It goes as the frequency to the fourth. That works. It all fits together. But we still don't know what they are. The repeater, the one repeater, we now suspect is something slightly different. But for the record, it's coming from a galaxy. We managed to get um, some optical detections at the same time. It's a tiny galaxy. It's a dwarf galaxy. Dwarf galaxies are two a penny. It's not even the center of the dwarf galaxy. Star-forming region in a dwarf galaxy. There must be zillions of those in the universe. What's going on? Um, somebody's applied deep machine learning to the data taken from that bit of the sky and found a lot more fainter pulses, so it, it is doing a lot of repeating. We still don't know what it is, but we're beginning to suspect it's different from the other 69 or so that we know about. A cautionary tale. The Parkes Radio Telescope in Australia was picking up a number of these bursts. And another category of burst that didn't seem quite the same and was a little bit puzzling because they all seemed to be at about roughly the same direction, sorry, the same distance, but in, in all sorts of directions. And they weren't at all sure what was going on until a grad student did a very interesting plot. This is a plot of the number of bursts against local time time of day, human day, and there's a peak between 12 and 1. What do we do between 12 and 1, folks? We have lunch. We microwave. <laughs> they have um, had a microwave oven or two on site. They had checked them very carefully that they didn't leak and give radio interference, so they thought it was okay. But listen up, because this affects you. If you stop a microwave oven by opening the door, it doesn't stop immediately. There's a short burst of microwaves, which you get in the chest, and the radio telescope picks up as a fast burst. And all these bursters were at the same distance. 
because a microwave oven's job is to turn water molecules in the form of ice into molecules in water to, into molecules in steam. That's how it heats the food. And the water molecule in ice vibrates at a slightly higher frequency than one in water, than one in steam. So the microwave scans down. And it happens to use a scan pattern which mimics <laughs> the one over F squared. But please, in future, maybe you do it already, stop your microwave oven by pressing the stop button. <laughs> and uh, congratulations to the grad student who thought to do that plot. Uh, they now ha no longer have microwave ovens on the radio astronomy site. Um, and the staff are unhappy because the convection ovens don't work so fast, but however. So where's all this going? Up till now, we have picked up these bursts by happenstance. We were doing pulsar observations, and oh, there's a burst. And it's sort of somewhere in that direction. The Canadians have a very new radio telescope in British Columbia, uh, near Penticton, for those who follow radio astronomy. And you can see it in this slide. It's called CHIME. It was designed to do work on hydrogen in the distant universe, but uh, it's been adapted m uh, in a minor way, and it's now good for picking up these bursts. And it has already seen a few bursts, and there's a rumor in the network that there's something else very interesting it's seen. Don't know what it is. Don't know if the rumor's accurate, but uh, it could be, because this is going to be one of the best telescopes we have for picking up these bursts. However, to state the obvious, astronomy, along with geology and archaeology, are observational sciences. You cannot say to the star, please turn up the wick, I want to measure so-and-so. You cannot say to the buried body, can we rerun your burial service, because I want to see it. And we can't say to the folded rocks, would you mind going straight and refolding, because we want to see it. In astronomy, you can't control nature. You can get better at picking up the pulses and be cleverer in what you do with the photons that nature sends you, but you can't control what nature sends you. But the ways we're moving are, for example, more simultaneous multi-frequency work. There's a newish telescope in South Africa called Meerkat. It's a radio telescope. It will be scanning the sky for transients, amongst other things. They have set up alongside it a little optical observatory with a, quite a small mirror, which covers the same patch of sky as the radio telescope and is slaved to the radio telescope in the sense that it points where the radio telescope points. So if they pick up a radio burst from there, there'll be an optical telescope looking there, and they'll be able to see if there was a bright optical flash or not. We can also make better use of the radio polarization data which tells us about magnetic fields. And there are a number of curiosities that we haven't yet resolved. If you look carefully at one of these sweeping plots, uh, this is not showing it very well, but in a, in a number of cases with this sweeping plot, you find that there are bright spots and then gaps and bright spots and gaps and gaps and spots as you go down the length of the sweep. And we don't yet know what's causing them. We don't know if they're stable or whether they change. They're probably some kind of plasma effect, but we haven't yet done much work on what those things are. And there's work to be done there still. And clearly, with the developments in machine learning, we can apply machine learning to the data. The one survey that's been done, I think, is asking for machine learning to be applied to that data, particularly if you're looking at the spot where there was once a burst and there hasn't obviously been one since. Can machine learning fish any out of the murk or not? I don't know. Uh, but that'll be quite a good test. 
It may be that these things are catastrophic events. They're the end of something, and it's been and gone and done it, and there's nothing to be seen subsequently. Certainly, they have observed for something like a thousand hours the sites of some previous bursts and found nothing. So I find this a hugely exciting and rapidly developing subject. I can't quite fulfill Yuri Milner's brief to say where we'll be in 10 years, but I think you'll understand why. And thank you for your interest. Um, one thing that, that you often hear about when people do this kind of astronomical experiments is uh, getting a data point from somebody else in the world. It seems like you would just, you know, immediately know what the, uh, the interference was if you had another data point from somewhere else. Yes. We're not too worried about interference because we're measuring the dispersion. We know these things have come past a hell of a lot of electrons. No, but I mean, this is sort of like microwave stuff. You would have oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, we were telling the Australians that they had a problem, but... Yeah. <laughs> When you look at the, sla the optical slave telescope with the radio telescope, the, what's the resolution of the angular resolution of the radio telescope? Can you tell exactly where it's looking in the optical image? Uh, the optical field of view is exactly the same as the radio field of view and is designed to be such. Um, but to get the radio telescope is quite a wide field of view, um, which means the optical is not the optimum for an optical telescope. But if there is a flash in approximately the right place as the radio burst, we'd be pretty happy. Did you see where in the image, though, that the, the optical image should be? In yes. Resolution? Broadly, you can see where. Yes, indeed. Yes. So the, Joseph, the success, the recent success in problems like this is gamma ray bursts, which, you know, I, re I remember were equally as mysterious. Yes. And they, you know, there we had the hint from the distribution that they were um, extragalactic and cosmological, and so even you know, at this point, do we know enough to know a, a character I mean, besides the fast repeater, the repeating one, a characteristic sort of redshift range to be thinking about? Yes. Um, in fact, we're doing slightly better than the gamma ray burst people because the first thing the gamma ray burst people were able to say, these things are evenly distributed over the sky, which could mean they were very local or very distant. And it wasn't until they got an optical identification that they could say the very distant option was right. Um, we already know these things must be very distant because of the rate of descent of that whistle and the number of electrons that there have to be. So we're a bit better there. And I've forgotten the rest of your question. Sorry. <laughs> Do you still have the microphone? Is that enough to give you a characteristic redshift? Yes, it is. And the ones we've found so far are between a redshift of 0.5 and 1. So we're talking several billion light years, which is quite significant. Last one, Becky. Um, perhaps I didn't follow this uh, closely, but... As I understood it, the pulsars you're finding within our galaxy, yes. um, why do you think we're, you're not seeing them outside of our galaxy? Are they detectable outside, or do they not occur? What, what would be your view? We're pretty certain that pulsars do occur in other galaxies, but just at the moment, soon to change, just at the moment our telescopes aren't sensitive, sensitive enough to see them, beyond our own galaxy. But they ought to be in every galaxy. Yep. Thank you. Well, fast radio burst may not cause the end of the world or be evidence of an alien attack, unfortunately, uh, but we are watching them very carefully in our Breakthrough Listen program just in case. Uh, 
but the end of our daytime session is, is uh, already upon us. So I'd like to thank all of our uh, uh, speakers today for these really fascinating talks. So if we can give them a round of applause. So if you're attending the panel discussions, which I think are gonna be really fun, it will begin promptly in this room at 5.30. Uh, I'd like to have a quick notice to our first panelist to come up here to uh, get wired. Uh, we promise not to use microwaves. Uh, and uh, the rest of the panelists, if you could come up and sit in the front row, uh, this is gonna be really fun. So thank you again, and this, the, the next sessions will begin at 5.30, thanks. <laughs>